Good morning. So for those who don't know me, my name is Charlotte. I am the youth coordinator here at UU Marin, and I am guest preaching for the a little bit of July and August for the next few weeks. So thank you for being here and for supporting me as I figure out this whole minister thing. <laughs> So last week, I spoke on the legacy of American disconnection that lives and breathes in our bodies. I talked about how the brokenness and pain we are witnessing in our world today directly comes from our lack of healthy personal and interpersonal connection. I will read again the words I shared last week by James Baldwin that influenced my understanding of this concept. Baldwin says, quote, I have always been struck in America by an emotional poverty so bottomless and a terror of human life, of human touch, so deep that virtually no American appears able to achieve any viable organic connection between his public stance and his private life. This failure of the private life has always had the most devastating effect on American public conduct and on black-white relations." End quote. Baldwin reminds us that to have a nourishing private life, we must be fully in our humanness, letting go of this terror of depth truth, vulnerability, realness. I have come to believe that our failure of private life is given to us just as our gender and sexual identities have been assumed onto us at birth. Yet, just as all societally imposed identities can be radicalized into our own unique and holy self-expression, so too can a failed private life be unlearned and transformed. In my continued experience of rebuilding and healing my private life, I have found there are several foundational characteristics that are most common in American living. These are perfection, stagnancy, performance, and fear of conflict. Today, I want to talk about perfectionism its dangers to our society, and the antidote I use when it appears in my internal world. So perfectionism. I'm curious how many people here would call themselves perfectionists or say they've been influenced by perfection in some way over the course of their life? OK. Some people know, which I'm quite impressed by. <laughs> So if you were to Google perfectionism, you will get many results, books, articles. It is a phenomenon that is widely spoken about in modern psychology and mindfulness circles today. Perfectionism, according to the internet, is when an individual strives to meet impossibly high expectations for themselves, pushing past their limit without rest or healthy self-encouragement of any kind. It is when someone is highly critical of themselves and others to the point of unfairness. Perfectionism causes defensiveness in the face of feedback, personal offensiveness when criticized. There is a fear of failure, fear of mistakes, and disapproval. An overemphasis on the I should haves of any situation. Perfection, according to many, is the antithesis to a healthy and successful life. After doing my research on the standard understandings of perfectionism, I had no difficulty connecting these characteristics to American living today. When I look at the educational system we are putting our kids through, let alone the one I myself have gone through, I see impossibly high expectations and pressure to be high performing. When I look at the corporate workforce and culture, I see a fast-paced, relentless world where mistakes or rest are not an option. 
And then, of course, there is the social media phenomenon that has gripped generations of young folks in the world today who are now constantly peppered with photos and videos of people living their perfect lives. In preparation for this sermon, I was thinking a lot about perfection and what it means to me. The first image that always comes to my mind is the classic ads from the 50s of housewives with their carefully manicured clothes and hair and cooking food for their working husbands with briefcases and their cute two kids in pigtails and overalls. It's interesting because I was never actually brought up with these images in my childhood. I've probably only seen them a few times in school, yet it is an image that is seared in my brain when I think of the words, a perfect life. And then, as much as I see myself as radical and progressive, it is also the image I see when I think of the words, a perfect woman. This is the white American dream, an ideal that has been built into the foundation of this country. It is more insidious in our culture than we think, living in our expectations, dreams, and beliefs. There may have been radical cultural transformations since the 50s, but we are still collectively influenced by the hope for American enlightenment, perfection. When I think about what it is like to be a human being, I am reminded of chaos, pure, lively, unrestricted chaos. And this American dream of a perfect family and perfect house is the opposite of chaos. It is control. I think that is what perfection is, a societal and personal attempt at controlling the pure pandemonium of what it means to be a human being. When we strive for perfection, we are building walls around the rawness of our full selves. This breeds shame, but simultaneously ignores it, making us terrified of our own deepest selves. You see, we are flawed, failures, mistake makers, trippers, and tripping hazards. We're whirling around in our lives trying to figure out what to do with ourselves, even if we have done it the day before and the day before. Perfection is non-existent, an illusion of control that can crumble at any moment. Death, illness, traffic, a screaming four-year-old, a stubbed toe. All of these are amongst the infinite amount of beautifully chaotic occurrences that crash and burn any thought we may have that we are in control. Human life should be a balance between pattern and chaos, a dance between the two. We should be taught at a young age to surrender to this flow, to yield to the unwieldiness of our spirits and the turbulence of our lives. Instead, the world we live in teaches perfection and control. It sneaks its dogma into parenting and relationships and communities because we have never been taught anything different. Perfection is both a deeply personal trait, one that is unique to each of us and our identities, and yet oddly enough, a reoccurring blueprint from human to human, particularly in America. So, you are looking at someone who lives and breathes a very strong perfectionist drive. For me, it comes in the form of get better, get better. These are the words that have echoed in my mind for as long as I can remember, get better. These are the words that underlie every decision I made and continue to make in pursuit of religious leadership, personal goals, and daily living, get better. A constant stream of you need to fix this, 
You need to stop doing this. You need to get over this. You need to be better. Why? Why do I need to be better? So that I can actually do some good in this world, so I can truly be a good minister and chaplain, so I can be successful and respected and loved. Am I even worthy of love if I don't get better? Perhaps if I build this wall around the things I don't quite like about myself, maybe, just maybe, no one will notice. Maybe I can fool everyone. If I strive to get better, maybe one day I'll become better. I've spent my entire life wanting to be better at things. My biggest drive has always been towards becoming a minister, a servant of God, a teacher, and a healer. Ministry is my passion, my purpose, my truth. I have pursued my spirituality and relationship with the, the divine wholeheartedly, throwing myself into uncomfortable situations of spiritual rigor so that I could be prepared for this work. This drive for, for perfection in ministry has been both a blessing and a curse. On one hand, it has given me the opportunity to work hard, challenge myself, and pursue something I love with the full force of a fiery comet hurtling through space. But on the other hand, these expectations for myself have removed me from opportunities of vulnerability and authenticity. And it has promoted mentalities of self-hatred, restlessness, and disappointment rather than self-love, patience, and encouragement. When I am wrapped up in being this perfect image of a, of a minister, then I am in defense mode, trying to prevent people from coming in too close, trying to convince myself that I am the image I want myself to be. There's another aspect of this drive towards perfection that I have found in my life. For a very long time, I tried to be the perfect friend, daughter, and woman. Why? Because I wanted to be loved. And there was a part of me, and there still is a part of me, that believed that if I didn't act, look, and sound a certain way, then I would not be loved. If I pretended like I was fine all the time, and always listened, and gave, and was sweet and nice, then people would love me. But what kind of love is it that I am receiving if I am approaching others from a place of guarded, performed perfection? Let's take a deep breath together and pause on this thought. That the American ideal of perfection is a currency for love and worthiness and a guard against the truth and chaos of human living. It is interesting to me because I know that and truly hope that while my situation is unique to me, it also very much is not. I'm sure that all of you sitting here today have had similar feelings of trying to perfect yourself in some way. We live in a society that has a deep, strong current of cultural perfectionism, so it is hard to avoid feeling like we are not constantly failing at something. So what are we to do? Should we fight the perfection, screaming affirmations of worthiness at ourselves and our mirrors every morning? Should we commit to failure? insistent on all anarchy against the perfectionist complex in our society? Should we try to love every single inch of ourselves? I would say all of these could have some usefulness at certain points in our journeys with perfection, but I believe that what we need is something more powerful, something that is organic. Because we're, we are not just working against perfection, but it's loyal soldiers, shame, and fear. This is no walk in the park. I want to make that clear. Perfection is an incredibly difficult 
profoundly powerful lived experience that can do far more damage to the well-being of our private lives than we think. And I believe that the answer, the mightiest force that we can utilize, is in forgiveness. I forgive myself for not being perfect. Instead of trying to simply overcome my fears and insecurities or focus on boosting my self-confidence or trying to love every single aspect of myself, which can be a daunting task, I'm realizing now that I must first try to forgive myself because forgiveness is transformation. Transformation, not fixing or overcoming or defeating. When something transforms, it does not change into something else. It evolves, it coalesces organically into a finer form of its own self. Forgiveness is the transformation of pain and hurt, of high expectations and a constant feeling of failure into a steady bodily knowing of ease and presence. It doesn't mean that the pain goes away and that I am magically fixed, unafraid, and confident and perfect. It means that I see these imperfections, these things that feel so heavy in my body, and I choose to let them be as they are without overwhelming me. I choose to move forward and live a life where my fears and insecurities are not made worse by any anger I might feel towards them. To do this is to allow for a softening, a release of tension. We are no longer angry at the imperfections, but rather in presence with them. We do not need to be in love with all of our imperfections. That is never a requirement. But if we seek to witness them, to witness ourselves in fullness and in truth, without illusions of control, then we release the power of perfection and invite in this new energy of transformation. Forgiving gives us the opportunity to see the growth and profound power in the flaws of our beings, the beauty inherent within us. Imperfection can be challenging transforming a radical energy that moves us to change, grow, and heal. By forgiving ourselves, we are empowering the imperfections to become co-conspirators in the expression of our brightest, fullest selves. You may ask, well, there must be some benefits to perfection. It influences people to work hard, to push themselves and challenge themselves in the pursuit of proficiency. I would say yes, but there are ways to pursue one's passion and to work hard without the drive of perfection. It is the drive towards mastery that we should be replacing perfection with. Mastery does not need, in, need perfection or anything close to it in order to be. Mastery, in fact, needs imperfection and it absolutely needs forgiveness. The master's journey is about just that, their journey. It is not the achievement of the end goal that matters, it is the path the master walks. The path to mastery is far from linear and far from the ideals of the perfectionist. It is filled with ups and downs and sideways backflips and cartwheels it is essential that the master actively forgives themselves every day for each flaw and mistake existent in their being, or they will be unable to move forward and learn from their experiences. So, I live with two dogs. You'll see where this is going in a second. So one of them is um, a year and a half old now. Uh, her name is Bixby. She's a border collie. Um, my housemates got her when she was six weeks old, so we've, we've had her since she was a baby. 
She's an incredibly special dog. She is full of personality and this tender love and exuberance. Uh, and she has taught me something incredibly important about perfection. So when I take Bixby's, Bixby for walks, I allow her to go off leash because she's very smart. She always stays by my side. And I allow her to do this because she really loves to play with sticks. And I don't want a, a leash to get in the way of that. Um, and, but Bixby, it's not really sticks that Bixby likes to play with. They're really branches, large, large branches like that are you know four, five, six times as big as she is. Um, and Bixby is a strong dog. She's about 40 pounds. Um, but some of the branches she tries to pick up are, are very, very big, <laughs> way too big for her. So I'll, I'll look over my shoulder, and there she is hauling this giant branch, trying to like bring it back with her to the house. And she's like gnawing at different parts of it so she can get a bit better like clamp on it. And, and it's, she's like moving her body around and just dragging away. And she's just trying so, so hard. <laughs> and you know what? She doesn't give up. I, and I, I don't speak dog. I don't know what's going through her head. Um, but I can guarantee you that there is not a single drop of perfectionism in her body or in her mind. She's not thinking to herself, I wish you were stronger. You need to be bigger in order to do this. What is wrong with you? Why are we even doing this? You should be able to drag this branch back to the house. I guarantee that she's not saying this because if she was, if this was what was going through her head, she'd just be staring at the branch. She would be transfixed by her own self-regrets and disappointments. So eventually, <laughs> Bixby will drag this branch about five feet. And when it becomes clear that it's not going to happen, she abandons that branch with the same ease that she approached it. She lets it go. And she doesn't walk the rest of the way home with her head hung low and just kind of whimpering a little bit. No, she just moves on to the next branch, one that is a little smaller <laughs> that she can bring home with her. So I know we're not all dogs, unfortunately. Um, but there's something to learn from Bixby. Whenever I see her doing this, I feel as if I am in the presence of this great, beautiful, holy lesson. In forgiving ourselves, we are actively at peace with our limitations. Would we prefer to be able to drag a 10-foot branch for two miles? Absolutely, I would love to do that. But sometimes that simply cannot happen. Sometimes we have to stick with a six-foot branch that is a little lighter. If we can forgive ourselves and our mistakes, limitations, flaws, then we can pivot, learn our lesson, and move forward without holding on to shame and anger. Then we can cultivate a sense of trust in our true natures. So how can perfectionism and forgiving ourselves be applied to the external world beyond our private lives? By seeing and forgiving the imperfections in ourselves, we are learning to see and forgive the imperfections that exist within the shared fabric of humanity, that which is in, in each human. To be actively forgiving with others is to uphold the belief in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. This doesn't mean that we take a step back and let it go or ignore the injustices of the world. Nor does it mean that we are in love with everyone. It means that we acknowledge the existence of something and choose not to allow it to affect our lives in a negative way. It means that we choose to act and live and transform despite the burdens and hardships of this world. If we are capable of forgiving, inclusive of all the ridiculousness that is our humanhood, then we have achieved a kind of love that burns away fear 
and collapses walls and fights for goodness and righteousness. A kind of love that births a private life rich in meaning. So at this moment, I call upon your beautiful full selves. I invite in the monsters and the shames and the mistakes of past, present, and future. I welcome them with loving arms because they are you, an essential aspect of you, and they must be forgiven. Let us reclaim the richness of our private lives by embracing ourselves in our wholeness, by forgiving ourselves and saying to the world, I may be flawed, but I am still powerful. I am still me. And I will love more fiercely than ever before. Amen. Blessed be. Thank you.